and welcome this Lord's Day to First Presbyterian as we begin our Advent season. And we will be focusing upon specifically the Lord Jesus Christ these next few weeks. And I look forward to our time together. Just a few quick announcements. <clears throat> Today, immediately following the benediction, much like last week, um, please just sit back down and we'll have the presentation of our budgets this year. And uh, those will be passed out to you and you'll have a chance to, to look at those and discuss those. And those will be presented to you today, immediately following the service. There are no Sunday night activities tonight, so no Vespers, no youth. We will go instead uh, across the street as they have their uh, kids' choir program, and many of our kids are singing in that, so I'd encourage you to go and support uh, them and uh, to go and listen to that. And that's at 6 o'clock, I believe, tonight from 6 to 7 across the street at the Baptist Church. So no activities here, and let's all go and support uh, our neighbors across the street. Uh, a few more things. Note again, um, if you're going to donate to our Christmas family this year, that's due next Sunday. Next Sunday we'll also have the installation of our officers for the women's ministry. Uh, also we'll have the Christmas cantata at 4.45. That's next week, 4.45, our Christmas cantata. December 13th, 10 o'clock a.m., women's minister gift bag packing for shut-ins at the Fellowship Hall. And also, uh, December 13th, children's Christmas program and Christmas gift offering for retired ministers and lay workers bring a refreshment to share. So very busy week. This time of year, of course, is busy for everyone. You're seeing family and friends and uh, parties and exchanging of gifts and all those things and uh, I know it's a busy time but please um, we would love to see you at all of these things to participate in these things and to support those who've worked so hard now uh, let us enter in briefly to our time of introducing Advent um, our <coughs> church tradition is to um, celebrate with scripture reading and prayer and the lighting of the Advent candle and we try to get different families to do it every year so this year we've asked the Austins to do the first reading very much you ladies did great as always 
Thank you. What a wonderful thing it is for our families to join in worship and in celebration of Advent. What a joyful thing it is to see God be faithful to generation after generation. And what a beautiful thing it is to see uh, soon to be newly ordained and installed elders take the lead there. So thank you for that, Austin family. That was wonderful. Well, let us take a brief moment of silence to prepare our hearts for worship. Please stand for your call to worship. Hear God's call from Psalm 33 this morning. Sing for joy in the Lord, O ye righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with lyre. Sing praises to Him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright and all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Amen. Let us sing to him now your insert, Sing We the Song of Emmanuel. Your insert in your bulletin. pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God with us. Lord, we thank you that he dwells with us, that he'll never leave or forsake us, but that he has been given as a ransom for the sins of his people and has rose again on the third day and now sits seated in the heavens next to you, reigning forevermore. Lord, we pray that that truth, the truth of the gospel, would inflame our hearts to love and awestruck wonder and worship this morning. We pray, O Lord, that you would dwell with us by power of your Holy Spirit, that everyone in here and that those around us in our community would say, surely God is in this place. 
We pray now the prayer the Lord Jesus taught us, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. this morning, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This time of year, though joyous or meant to be joyous sometimes can be less than that sometimes it can be depressing sometimes it can be lonely sometimes it can be frustrating and often you see your own selfishness and other selfishness during this time of year even though you shouldn't that's the reality of living in a fallen world and being a fallen son or daughter of adam we often when we need to be the most generous can be the most selfish. So sin doesn't stop in the month of December, even though I wished it would. And so with that, we need to come to the Lord this morning and confess our failures and hear the good news of the gospel. So please join me in this corporate prayer. Our Father, forgive our sins. Forgive the sins that we remember and the sins we have forgotten. Forgive our many failures in the face of temptation and those times when we have been stubborn in the face of correction. Forgive the times we have been proud of our own achievements and those when we have failed to boast in your works. Forgive the harsh judgments we have made of others and the leniency we have shown to ourselves. Forgive the lies we have told to others and the truths we have avoided. Forgive us the pain we have caused others and the indulgence we have shown ourselves. Lord God, have mercy on us and make us whole. In Jesus Christ, our Savior's name, amen. Please take a brief moment to silently confess your sins before the Lord. Amen. People of the Lord Jesus, lift your eyes and hear the good news of God's saving grace for you this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Lord has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which, he was, grant, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. Let us respond to God's grace with gracious giving.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give thanks to you for your graciousness to us. You have blessed us in ways beyond measure. And so now, Lord, we worship you with our gifts and our offerings and ask, O oh Lord, that you would take them, that you would bless them, that you would multiply them so that your gospel may be proclaimed, your people saved, sanctified, and glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing that great Advent hymn, hymn number 194, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, 194. Amen. Please be seated. Didn't they do such a great job? They did. They did a great job. We have a loaded group of talented children, that is for sure. That is for sure. Every one of them can sing better than Lawrence. So. All right. 
minutes. Well, before we go to God and his word, let us go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for the sound of our children who sing the praises of Emmanuel, who sing and who read and who praise you with their mouth. We ask, O Lord, that you would bless each of them, that each child here and those who are not able to make it, but each child of our church would be blessed with your Holy Spirit, that they would grow in the knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ every day, that you would help their parents to lead them and disciple them well, that you would help all of our children's workers and youth um, workers to help disciple them, to come alongside the parents, to show them the way of the gospel so that, Lord, 20, 30, 70 years from now, they will be trophies of your grace, full of the spirit and of truth, walking in the ways of their master, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray during this time of Advent, this Christmas season, that you would help point us to what truly matters, to point us to those things which are real, spiritual truths that last forever. Lord, even though we enjoy the material blessings, and we do, you've given them to us, and we ask, Lord, that we would use them and enjoy them in the right way, we do pray, Lord, that you would not allow us to be consumed with them, to turn them into idols, but see them as gifts given by a gracious giver. Lord, we ask that you would be with our country. We think specifically of those in the military this morning who are far off, who are away from their families, seeking to uphold justice and truth, defending our freedoms. It can be lonely without uh, being without their families, without uh, the dinner table with loved ones. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless them. I pray that our congregation would be a great blessing to them as we send out cards. We ask that they would be a great encouragement to them, that they would be further strengthened in their duties. Now, Lord, as we pray and come to your word, we ask that you would speak to us for your servants. Listen, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah this morning, the book of Isaiah. We will take these next few weeks to focus in, as we do every Advent season, on the Lord Jesus. Advent is a really means a time of waiting and anticipation, just as Israel and God's people waited the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So we now wait for His second coming. And so as we reflect on His first coming, it, the intention is that it would build our anticipation. That it would help us to fix our gaze on His return. This Advent season, I've decided that we will look at really one verse for the next four weeks, but we're going to focus in on those that fourfold royal name given in Isaiah 9 6. The one that is often repeated. In fact, it was read this morning. In this fourfold name, we find well, we find great truths about the Lord Jesus Christ that are worthy to be meditated upon, worthy to be celebrated, worthy to be used. And so we look at Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to read the first seven verses, but again, we will focus in primarily on verse 6, and really this morning we'll focus just on the fact that he is a wonderful counselor. Isaiah chapter 9, hear God's holy word beginning in verse 1. But there will be no more gloom. 
for her who was in anguish. And in earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle to molt and, and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, let me begin with a question. The question is this. What has been the darkest day of your life? What has been the darkest day of your life? There are many answers that could be given. Perhaps you think of a day of national tragedy. Perhaps a day that you realize that not all was right in the world, maybe for the first time that something struck you in such a way that you no longer felt safe. You no longer felt, well, you no longer felt that everything was okay. There are many days, even in our own country's history, some of you can tell me where you were when you heard that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And I've talked to several people who were alive then and they said uh, that that was a, that was one of those days for them. Even his, uh, those who would uh, be considered on the uh, opposite political spectrum as JFK have said that it was at that day that something, well, it struck them deeply and it was a dark day in their lives. In my own lifetime, I've seen a couple of days that I can tell you exactly where I was during these national events and, and the darkness that I felt and the uneasiness that I felt, the first one would be with the Columbine shooting. I can tell you exactly where I was, what TV I was watching, what room and who was in there as they showed the footage from Columbine. It would not be much uh, later after that that I can tell you of the other great day, September 11th. 2001, I can tell you, I was speaking with, to uh, Donnie Sanders just the other day, and I mentioned to him, I could tell you exactly where I was. I could walk you into Miss Brotherton's class. I could tell you the desk I sat at. I could tell you who was sitting around me, and I could tell you what the person next to me said when we went into class. But perhaps the darkest day in your life is not a national tragedy, but it's a personal tragedy. Maybe the darkest day of your life is the day that you found out that your loved one, your spouse, your parent, your child was not going to make it. Perhaps it was the day you found out the disease was not going to be cured. Perhaps it was the day when your family disintegrated, it broke up. Divorce, anger, who knows? There are many days like that in the world that we live in, and we all have them. But yet, the gospel speaks to us 
and offers us light in the midst of darkness. It offers us a word of hope in the midst of great despair. And that's exactly what we find here in Isaiah chapter 9. We find words to comfort us. We hear of a coming Savior who will put the world to right. Who will come and make His blessings flow far as the curse is found. And this morning we will focus in on this great coming Savior who is called a wonderful counselor. A wonderful counselor. The first thing I want us to look at is the need for this wonderful counsel. Secondly, we'll see the character of this wonderful counsel. And thirdly, the supply of this wonderful counsel. First, let's look at the need. What is the need for this wonderful counsel? Why was this word, this royal name, and that's what these are. These are royal names that often would be given to kings. And what Isaiah is saying here is he's saying there's one coming. There's a king that's coming that's greater than all other earthly kings. And he's the one who truly exemplifies this fourfold royal name beginning with wonderful counselor. But why did they need to hear that? They needed to hear it because Isaiah is prophesying to the people of Judah saying, the tide has turned. Assyria is coming and Babylon will come later. And they will destroy the land of God's people and they will send you out into exile. You will be defeated. God's people had taken for granted God's kindness to them, His eternal covenant with them. They had taken that for granted. They began bringing in uh, idol worship with the impending danger. Ahaz and others thought it would be wise counsel to partner with these pagan nations instead of trusting in the Lord. And so God, through the prophet Isaiah, has brought language of judgment. He's brought language of judgment to God's people. Yes, there's language of hope that we'll get to shortly. But in the immediate, he's saying, this will not be turned around. There will be death and destruction. And I would invite you to look at the language that is used to speak about this. If you go to chapter 8, chapter 8, which is meant to be gut-wrenching. And I won't read the whole chapter, but Beginning in verse 19, it says, When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be en enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. What terrible words coming from the prophet of God to God's people that famishedness, hard-pressed, gloom, darkness is coming. It reminds me of the line that I love so much in The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. And they're describing the great white witch, the evil witch, and what it's like to, to live under her rule. And the character says, might be Mr. Beaver, somebody can correct me. But he says, with her, it's always winter and never Christmas. It's always winter, but never Christmas. Here, the people of God are going about to go through a great winter. And they will wonder, will it ever be Christmas? And perhaps that's exactly where you are this morning. Perhaps that's your heart this morning. Perhaps... Your heart is encased in, an, in a 
a snow globe of winter. And you think the sun will never shine again. You walk outside and all you see is darkness. Every day is gloomy. Even the most beautiful, sunny spring day is gloomy to you. You can't see past the major issues that you have. You turn to others and you say, I need help. I need counsel. Or perhaps even worse, that's a good thing to do, but perhaps you, perhaps you recoil. You isolate yourself. I recently received word that a family member, a dear family member, has is going through something terrible and a deep depression has isolated himself. He's not eating. He's not taking care of himself. He's wasting away and the family is concerned. Perhaps, perhaps you know something of that. And so we have a need for wonderful counsel. And what, what is this wonderful counsel? What, what is it that, that needs to come? What is it that Israel and what is it that we need to hear? What is this need and how can it be fulfilled? Well, first, we need to understand really what it means to sit under a great king why it would have mattered to them. They need a king who is righteous, who will lead them, who will guide them, who will protect them, who will care for them. A king that, as John Calvin says, that living under him would bring supreme and everlasting happiness to be enjoyed. And so in the face of great distress and great danger, God and His prophet gives a word of comfort. And I just love it. I just love what He does. Does He say there's going to be a great king that will come and destroy everyone? Does He say I'm going to bail you out? Does He say I'm bringing a great warrior? All those may be applicable. But here He brings the word that a child will be born. God often says it's the foolish things that confound the wise, that God's foolishness is far greater than man's wisdom. As Ray Ortland says, God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us is a child. Some of you are already celebrating Christmas and you have small children and you think, I think Ray got that one backwards. A child is what has terrorized us. But here in the midst of this deep grief and fear, he gives a prophecy of a coming child and they need to hear it. And perhaps this morning you need to hear it. That is the need we have for counsel, for wise counsel. But let's look at the character. Let's look at the character and what it is. Number two, the character of this, this wonderful, wise counsel, this wonderful counsel. What does it mean? Well, first of all, your translation may separate those words, wonderful and counselor, uh, counselor with a, a comma, as if it's two different, um, two different titles. I won't go through the, uh, I won't bore you this morning with uh, Hebrew grammar and why it's probably best translated as one title, wonderful counselor. But it is one name that combines two words that are, have vast and weighty meanings. The idea that God uh, is a, or that this child would be a wonderful counselor. We, you know, we use the word wonderful now often very flippantly. Man, that steak was wonderful. Oh, that movie, it was wonderful. Or perhaps this time of year you like watching It's a Wonderful Life. I've never actually seen it. And if you try to convince me to watch it, it'll just, I'll just dig my heels in even more. I'm not going to watch it. I've made it this long. I will not give in. But we use that word wonderful so, uh, so flippantly and so casually that we really have forgotten the root and what it actually means. In Scripture, this word is often used, most often used, to speak of an awe-inspiring divine, supernatural act. You think of what happens in the book of Exodus. 
with God saving His people out of Egypt and bringing them through the great flood, destroying all their enemies. It's, it signifies that this kind of wonderful behavior is that which something only God Himself can do. And isn't that exactly what God does? How often does God bring us to the end of our rope to the very end where we have no resources of our own left and God shows up and does something great and at the end of that what happens God gets the praise because you say I could have never worked this out it could have never happened this way only God could have done this that's the kind of acts it speaks about here it combines the idea of doing something wonderful, extraordinary, and miraculous with the skill of giving wise advice, making plans, and counsel. A counselor in this setting would have been that, which, that person who advises a great king on what to do next. And we have political advisors now that do that. We have cabinets of people who do that. We have those people in our own life who come and they would give us wise counsel. Tell us what to do. Tell us how to proceed. But this is far greater than that. Isaiah is not saying that this child will be a divine therapist who's going to give you some really good advice. And he's just better than all the other therapists. That's not the case. This is a miraculous person, a miraculous God, who does extraordinary things, who imparts wisdom to you that is beyond all human comprehension, who accomplishes things and who teaches you things that are otherwise a mystery, who leads you in such a way that at the end of your journey you can say only God has done this. This is a different kind of of wisdom that is offered here by this wonderful counselor. Commentator Alec Motier says this, he says, the decisions of a king make or break a kingdom, and a kingdom designed to be everlasting demands a wisdom like that of the everlasting God. This is not earthly wisdom, this is heavenly wisdom. But what does that wisdom look like? What is it? Uh, Point me to something, you might say. Help me see what this may look like. Well, let's go, of course, to the Scriptures. You could go first to Psalm 139, verse 6, where the psalmist says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. You could go to Proverbs 8, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, and find these attributes of wisdom, that speaks about wisdom being from the beginning, born of God, calling out to God's people. I'll read just a few select, you don't have to turn there, I'll read just a few select things from Proverbs 8. But notice the character first of this everlasting wisdom from Proverbs 8. He says this in verse 22, The Lord possessed me, speaking of wisdom, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of His way, before His works of old. From everlasting I was established. From the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth, when there were no depths I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills I was brought forth. While He had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the dust of the world, when He established the heavens, I was there. When He inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. When He made firm the skies above. When the springs of the deep became fixed. When He set for the sea its boundary, so that the water would not transgress His command when He marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside Him as a master workman, and I was daily His delight, rejoicing always before Him rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. You see, this, the uh, writer here in Proverbs is telling you that this one who embodies wisdom 
This one who embodies wisdom is from everlasting to everlasting. He was involved in the creation of all things. He owns all things. He's been there. He knows the Creator Himself on an intimate and personal level because He is with Him. It should make you think immediately of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Face to face with God. The Father and the Son. More from Proverbs 8. Listen for I will speak, verse 6, noble things. And the opening of my lips will reveal right things. For my mouth will utter truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterances of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. Think about that. How often have you gone to someone and perhaps they have... Perhaps they have good intentions. Oftentimes they don't, but perhaps they have good intentions. And you go to someone for wise counsel. You go to someone for advice. You go to someone to get direction. And what they tell you contradicts reason and it contradicts Scripture and it contradicts the things of God. It happens all the time. Of course you should leave your spouse. God just wants you to be happy. And you're not happy with them. That's terrible advice. That's not biblical advice. It's not wise advice. God doesn't care what you do. He just wants you to enjoy life. Everybody cheats on their taxes. You can get away with it. It's just a little bit. The government has enough of our money anyways. Of course you should keep secrets from your spouse. Of course you shouldn't tell them the truth. That's just going to make things worse. How often have we received such poor counsel and yet, Proverbs 8 says, the one who brings great wisdom, there is no crookedness, no deception, no perversion, nothing but truth and righteousness. That is the character of this wonderful counselor. That is the character of the wisdom that he brings. I read part of this quote earlier, but this commentary, Gary Smith, I'll read the entire thing. He's putting both words together, wonderful counselor, and it says it combines the idea of of doing something wonderful, extraordinary, and miraculous with the skill of giving wise advice, making plans, and counsel. We read that earlier. But then it goes on, it says, this suggests that this son's life will somehow exhibit miraculous acts of God employed in the sphere of wise planning or decision making. Since God is the source of all miraculous events and his plans are the wisest counsel to follow, God will work in and through his son to demonstrate his extraordinary wisdom to plan wonderful, miraculous things. Have you received that wisdom this morning? Have you seen that in your own life? Have you seen God work in such a grand and miraculous way that defies all logic? You see, friends, this is the wisdom that we need, but we could also go to Psalm number 11. No, I'm sorry, 111. Psalm number 111. In Psalm 111, it's, a, it's a, a partner to Psalm 112. And in verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. That, Reminds you of the Proverbs, no doubt. But listen here as uh, the psalmist here in Psalm 111 describes what a wonderful counselor would be like to rule over his people. He says, praise the Lord, verse 1. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. Wonderful are the works of the Lord. Awe-inspiring are the works of the Lord. Logic-defying are the works of the Lord. Divine are the works of the Lord. 
Verse 2, great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hand are truth and justice. All His precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to His people. He has ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. It is living under this wonderful counselor of Psalm 111 that you actually get the effects of Psalm 112. Where righteousness endures forever. Judgment is maintained. The righteous are remembered forever. The wicked are put down. The poor have been given freely to. Our hearts are upheld. Fear is taken away. Steadfast trusting continues on. You see the, the needs of Israel and Judah and Isaiah Chapter 9 are the exact needs of us today. That's exactly what we need. That's the kind of character, uh, of the, the, the character of the kind of wisdom that we need. So this is, a, this is a great wisdom and counsel above all others. Not just greater, but of a, of a different, it's not just different qualitatively, it's different quantitatively it's a it's a whole nother realm so we've seen the need we've seen the character but what about the supply how do we get this how do we tap into this how do we receive such counsel how do we receive what this child has to offer in Isaiah chapter 9 how does it come to us Well, just as we've already said a few times and even hinted around a few more, it comes in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, Ray Ortland's, Ray Ortland said, God's answer to everything has, that has terrorized us is a child. In this child given to us in Isaiah 9, in this one, the one who is born, who is God and man, Truly God and truly man, the divine who has assumed humanity. He has taken human flesh to Himself who was born in a manger to the Virgin Mary. The one that we confess every Sunday. All wisdom is found in Him such that in His life, in John chapter 7, the Pharisees and the, uh, the government officials are talking and they say to the government officials, the police of that day, they say, why didn't you bring Him in? And in John 7, 46, they say, never has a man spoken about the way this man speaks. He speaks totally different. We can't trick him. We're not smarter than him. Everything he says is pure and beautiful and true and good and wise. Never has a man spoken like this. He's completely different. He's not just another teacher. He's not just another rabbi. And of course He's not. Jesus Himself said before Abraham was, I am. Echoing what happens in Exodus when Moses asked God for His name. And He says, that, tell them, I am has sent you. Jesus Christ, the One born to human flesh, the One who assumed humanity, the One who lived a perfectly obedient life, is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And just as Him taking poverty to Himself did not extinguish His riches, Him taking human flesh to Himself did not extinguish His heavenly wisdom. His earthly life was full of divine wisdom. So He is justly called wonderful, says Matthew Henry. For He is both God and man. 
His love is the wonder of angels and glorified saints. In his birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, he was wonderful. A constant series of wonders attended him, and without controversy, great was the mystery of godliness concerning him. He is the counselor, for he was intimately acquainted with the counsels of God from eternity, and he gives counsels to the children of men in which he consults our welfare. It is by him that God has given us counsel. He is the wisdom of the Father and has made of God to us wisdom. Some, he says, join these together, these words together, and they should be joined together because in this, as in other things, he has the preeminence. None teaches like him. In Christ, we have all of the wisdom and riches of God given to us. And you say, well, but, but help me. Let's push this further. How do I get this wisdom? I know Christ has it. Well, James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus became to us wisdom from God. But 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16 says this, For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For whom among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. He goes on to say, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit because they're foolishness, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual praises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. How is that possible? Because in John chapter 14, the Lord Jesus Christ said, If I go away, I send what? A helper, I send a counselor. I send my spirit who is full of wisdom, who searches the deep things of God. And by virtue of union with Christ, that spirit lives in you and you have the mind of Christ. You see, wisdom didn't stop. And Jesus didn't stop bringing wisdom in his incarnation. No, he brings wisdom and guides you and cares for you even now. He is the great ruler and king, the one who receives all true glory and praise, the one who is truly deserving of those royal names, the one who is truly called Wonderful Counselor, has given you himself. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I know the dark clouds are here. But the darker the clouds, the deeper the mercy that God will bring to you in Christ Jesus. That's what the people of Israel needed to hear, friends, and that's what you need to hear this morning. That there is one who has come, who is full of wisdom, full of grace and truth, and he is yours and you are his. And he says, freely ask, what do you need? I'll give it to you. You need wisdom, I'll give it to you. You need counsel, I'll give it to you. You need help, I'll give it to you. That's the promise of the coming Savior. The wonderful counselor. Do you know him this morning? Do you know that counsel? I pray you do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you truly are the wonderful counselor. You are the one who brings all good things to us, the one who guides and leads us. 
Lord, we so often stray. We so often follow the wisdom of the world, which is truly foolishness. Lord, by your Spirit, would you guide us, lead us to the cross, lead us to the true fount of wisdom. Help us, Holy Spirit, you who search the deep things of God, search our hearts, and apply this truth to our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and respond to God's word and song, hymn number 198, the first four verses, 198. Lift up your heads, you mighty gates. Please remember to uh, uh, sit back down after the benediction so that we can have our congregational meeting. Hear now your benediction. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. May that be true of you this morning. And may that God be with you now and forever. Amen.